My next guest is someone who I think many people with school-going ch- children will find interesting. Now, her name is Anne Tam, and she is the owner and uh, managing director, founder, of course, of uh, Ace Adventure Group, which in turn owns Dwi Emas International Schools, Sri Emas uh, International Schools, and so on. Now, she's not always been an entrepreneur. I think the year was 1995, and uh, she was an English tuition teacher, teaching kids, I think there were six of them, from her uh, the dining room in her house. And uh, it had been a number of years that she decided she, she, she discovered this quite disturbing phenomenon, that school-going kids, although having learned English in school for a number of years, still did not display any level of proficiency in the language. Now, um, she had two daughters, and she tried to find alternative means of teaching her kids, uh, and of course her, te- her kids as well, uh, her students, all to no avail. And so with about 4,000 ringgit in savings, and quite a lot of courage, she decided to branch out on her own. Now fast forward to 2023, and she's the owner of a number of international schools, she's expanding all over the country, and quite a, lot, a number of uh, learning centers all over the country as well. Now it's quite interesting for me because not many tuition teachers can become successful entrepreneurs. It requ- requires different skill sets, different brain functions, and and it's quite uh, unusual to find someone of these abilities in, in one person. So I hope you enjoy this video as much as I did uh, recording it with Anne. As always, do uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. If you agree with what she said, disagree, um, like the video. If you did, in fact, like the video. Subscribe to the channel. That's always a great help if you can do that. And so, dear viewers, uh, without further ado, me and I'll present uh, Anton. And thank you for doing this. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to talk to you. Now, there's many, many things we'd like to uh, talk about today, obviously, but um, let's start with, with yourself. Uh, I, I know I've, tr- I've read your story uh, in, in the public media, and I understand that you really came to the whole field of education uh, because you were a teacher yourself, right? And you started off life um, quite intriguingly at your dinner table uh, with with some friends uh, and your students, right? Let's start there and tell me where you came from. That's a long story, yeah. <laughs> First, uh, I was teaching in the colleges, yeah, um, and uh, it's coming from a space from a teacher, and you literally have very minimal resources. I had like what uh, when I started, I started with four thousand ringgit. I'm like, what can I do with that? Um, and but what was clear was that I needed to do something about English teaching because it wasn't making any sense when I was teaching at the colleges. So um, I said, no, I cannot have my children going through this, you know, because I couldn't find a solution to it. So I was talking to some friends about it and they said, and you, you go ahead, you start it and I will send my son. I was like, hmm, okay, I think I can do that. Um, started looking into the possibility and lo and behold, yes, I started from my dining table. Uh, there were classes, I had two classes with only one student each and it grew from there. Okay, uh, but that's how it went. Classic, st- classic rule of business is uh, start an enterprise with a pain point in mind, right? And then solve it. The thing is, um, I don't really want to zoom 20, 30 years ahead of, of time because obviously, you know, uh, I'd like to say that English as a, as a mean medium of communication in this country still has a long ways to go, right? But let's just st- stay in that era for a little while. And you started with 4,000 ringgit with kids at your dinner table, right? Um, not many teachers, let alone tuition teachers, go from there to international schools and you know thousands of students, students and multiple educational establishments. So you are both teacher and entrepreneur, right? Yeah. How does that journey happen for you? Uh, it's, it's not by intention. It was more like, uh, as we went along, it was the right thing to do. So uh, and then we realized that our vision and our purpose was the one that got us to where we were going because we were very, very clear from the get-go that uh, I was doing this for the children and I was, you know, as many kids as possible. That was the mandate, as many kids as possible. But who knew that it could end up becoming thousands of students? Right, because I was looking at, okay, Subang Jaya had about 20,000 students and I think if I can get 50 of them, I'll be very happy. That's how it started, right? Um, and it grew to the point where at one point in Subang, I had uh, close to 2,000 students uh, and uh, they were with me year on year and, and so on. So um, the key thing that I realized was how do I keep the students learning English? Because in college, I was like, 
tearing my hair out and trying to fix a problem that took 11 years of schooling to create. Okay, there is no way you can learn a language for 11 years and be bad at it. And you had 60% of students just not having the language that is required. I mean, 11 years. Yeah, uh, if you start learning Japanese right now, I tell you, if you do it for 11 years, you will be like a native speaker. So what went wrong with that? And there we were having to fix it in six months. That was the thing that didn't make any sense to me. So I started uh, looking at all the problems and we went backwards and started it from year one and started to fix those issues. Uh, kids being afraid to speak. You start at that age, they're not afraid to speak, right? And so to my students, you can put them in front of anybody by the time they're done. They have no fear of speaking to anybody. And huh, you're afraid of presenting, you know? So things, that was what I wanted to, the intention. And it worked because um, the kids stayed with me, some of them all the way to 13 years. So one, I'm one of the few teachers who have, who have actually had the privilege of teaching children, not for short term, but some of them eight years, nine years, 10 years, 11 years, that's very common. I even had 13 years and whole families, 25 years of journey with me, you know? So things like that. Uh, and because of that, you could see, um, I could, I could um, identify what was missing because uh, people are struggling at upper sec, but I traced it back to something you need to do in year one itself. Yeah. So, so the skills that you need to, to have to do these things, um, it can be kind of like demarcated in this way, right? Because to be a teacher, you will have to have some kind of sectoral knowledge as well. But you also need to perform in front of the class, right? There's an entertainer element because you have to connect with the student and develop a chemistry. So there's a bit of a, I think it's the, the creative side is the, is it the right brain or the left brain? I can't remember, right? Right brain. Right brain, great. So you need to be a little bit of a right brain person to be an effective teacher. But then to, to drive process and to modularize what you do at a teaching level, to then deliver it across thousands of students, the, requires a left brain mentality, which is an engineer's mentality, right? To have someone like you who can do both is unusual to say the least, because a lot of teachers, they can do very well in front of one student, right? And develop that one student, right, well. But then to do that effectively across two thousands is tough. So how did you do that? You know, you're the first person who actually picked up on that and asked me that question. Um, I've been on quite a number of, of shows and interviews and so on, but no one has asked that question. Um, so it, uh, okay, I think my, my strength since the day I started teaching, because I was dealing with children, all this is trained by the children. Because I'm like, how do I break this down for this child? How do I break this down for the whole class? So I started doing a lot of that, uh, whatever it is I was doing with them. Like say, for instance, how do you unlock the ability to write? How in the world do you fix their language problem and hack it for, for another, you know? So, um, and then how do I convince them uh, to use descriptives? and not call it flowery language, for instance, yeah? So a lot of teachers say, oh, you, you got to make it flowery. But no, it's actually about using descriptions. But how do you make it so easy that in a space of five minutes is clear, right? So I had to figure that out and I did. Um, so English is a hack for me. I tell you, give me five minutes, uh, I can unlock someone's uh, ability to speak properly and not sound like they're struggling with the language. Um, you give me five minutes a day and I can train someone how to become very proficient in language, you know. That is powerful because English is the lingua franca of the business world. Now, oftentimes I come across people, kids typically, right? who are very, very smart, but who come from underprivileged backgrounds. And you just get the sense that if they can just have that exposure to the English language, their world will just unfold, right? And they will, all their opportunities will explode because they're locked in their native language and it's typically not English, right? It's BM or even Mandarin to some extent. And then you, ex you, then you just extrapolate that over the whole ASEAN region. They're stuck in Tagalog, they're stuck in, you know, in Tamil or whatever. If they can somehow have that access, it will be so empowering for them. It is. It... What's the science in that five minute span? What's the science? Um, it's actually letting people know uh, how you learn a language naturally. 
So the way we've been teaching them uh, over the years, it's not just in our country, it's all over Asia. Anytime anybody tries to teach the language, it becomes very technical. Yeah, past participles and past tense, no one cares about all those things. I can show you why grammar doesn't work, to, to uh, acquire proficiency. In fact, you want to do grammar well, you better know the language well in order to attempt the exercises. <laughs> exactly. So that's like coming from the other direction, which is yeah. defeating the purpose. Yes. So, um, because I, I can even prove it to people as to why it doesn't work, but uh, because it's so entrenched in the country, like me even saying this, I could have probably a whole load of teachers out there and practitioners or even parents out there who completely disagrees with me. Because uh, very often when I'm doing my classes, there are those, but Anne, you're not doing grammar. I say, yeah, because I didn't acquire my language through grammar. No, no native speaker did it that way. You want to keep your kids at second language level by all means. You do grammar, that's where you're going to keep them. If you want to see the errors they create, just because they picked up the technical aspects first, I can give you plenty, you know, including uh, workbooks written by, uh, you know, said experts in the field because they teach English, but they go uh, technical. And the technical problem showed up because it doesn't apply in this context. There are other rules at play. I have tons. And so, uh, but it's kind of difficult to, to tell that to a whole nation or even nations that, that that's how you acquire it, you know. But um, we have, we've done it with plenty of students, you know, from, uh, I, 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 you can change it in six months yeah. if they do it, like those really weak, like can change it in six months if they do it five minutes every day. So what, what's the five minute um, rule? Um, the key thing is you have to listen to the language. You see, people go straight into writing the language. Um, you have to spend your time listening and speaking the language. Uh, no, listening and uh, uh, yeah, speaking the language. With these two skills alone, you can pick up any language all over the world. Uh, and so many languages do not have the written form. So how in the world do you learn them, right? Speaking, listening and speaking. And even if you look at the way we learn it when we were when we were children or little toddlers, you don't go around showing them grammar. You don't get them to write first. It's always listening and they take around two years. When you don't anchor that, you will not have that fluency and the accuracy that they need, you know? Yeah. Uh, so so we, we created very artificial uh, environment for that to happen. So we teach the kids to read, but listen, listen and speaking is my priority. Yeah, but when you read at the same time, you are reading perfect English, but you have to orally speak it so you can hear it, you know, and you verbalize it. Then the flow comes because when you write, you don't, okay, I'm going to put noun first and subject first. We don't. We write. And you know when a sentence is off or something is off. Why? Because it sounds off or it doesn't feel right. Or um, uh, I write the way I, I hear it. That Those are the answers that we lang English uh, speakers um, say, right? When we know a sentence is right. But we don't go into the gra grammatical things. But people don't get it. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that language is actually all about communicating okay. effectively, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that you've got to use the you know uh, words with you know the, the most number of um, um, uh, letters inside to communicate well. Uh, of course, if you want to impress people and your business partners, then you use the bigger words and the more technical language. Uh, but just to communicate an idea, you don't need to like. So you know how like last time when your kids when you watch the Chinese uh, drama. You know, last time in the 70s, 80s, like 30, 40 episodes, right? Actually, a lot of people have told me they learn Cantonese from watching those videos. And you know, when I go to Japan for 10, 20, 10, two week, 10 days, two weeks, huh? when you just talk to waiters, people on the street, you can pick up pidgin Japanese within days just to communicate, where can I buy coffee? Where can I go to the toilet? This and that, right? Just basic. Even Thailand is the same thing. So I think what you say is very true. But then to deliver that, those principles over a number of students, how do you do that? Because you can't, you can't follow that yourself. You have to find other teachers who can deliver those models. So how did you drive that process? Um, from early on, I knew that in order to do this and get this to more people, I had to replicate what I do. So I had to simplify the whole process um, so that people can do it. Um, and so 
because like I said, the whole thing was more because of figuring out how to make it happen, particularly for the children. Um, then after that, it's about making, because I got scolded before by a parent uh, when my classes were full and I couldn't take on any more. And they scolded me, you know, you're so selfish. Why, why can't you open up more classes? <laughs> you know, it was really, it was an interesting scold. And I said, uh, because I'm already teaching how many hours, but then I was also at the point where uh, I made the decision to hire teachers and teach them everything I know um, and give them everything that they they need to do is what they need to do is replicate it. You know? And we did. And to today, that's how we managed to grow ourselves to uh, three schools now. And, uh, you know, having said that, we're opening a few more, but that's another story. But uh, it was from there. Um, and making it so easy that anybody can follow. Well, then, as an entrepreneur, right, um, the, the, you talk about the, the idea of talent flight. Because once you pass on your knowledge, then they go and open their own school and then they, they take that IP away from you, right? How did you manage all that? Okay, that's another good one. Um, actually, I, I didn't... Um, it was front and centre, I can, I can tell you that, because you hear horror stories. Yes, you hear, you hear horror stories of how um, someone you, tea, you, you, you taught, right, actually opened one down the street from you. I mean, if they open somewhere else, it's all right, yeah. So that was actually quite front and centre when I decided to do this. But, um, you know, I, a friend gave me a very, um, an amazing cassette at that time, yeah. Uh, and I listened to it, it was John C. Maxwell's uh, book, um, audio book. Uh, I can't quite recall the title now, but uh, it had to do with walking in, uh, walking in uh, your steps or shoes or something like that. So you have to have, if you want to replicate what you do, you got to get people to walk in your shoes and literally replicate exactly what you do. And uh, John C. Maxwell being a pastor in a church in the US, that was how they did and what they did. And they grew a huge congregation, right? But at the same time, he was training uh, business leaders. So I, I said, you know what? I really like this. And so I used that. And I, it, I never looked back since. Now, then what about the teachers? Um, I, I encourage them to open centers, you know? Um, so we, at one point, at its highest point, we had 14 centers. And okay, so it was kind of like a semi-franchise where you part license. own these, okay, licensing mm -hmm. lah. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's interesting. So you, you capture two birds with one stone, right? You get them, you retain them, but then, then they also have some ownership in that entity. Yes. And some of them are still with me to today, you know. So why, why not 140? Why not 1,004? Why, why only 14? Because, if, you know, franchises can be thousands of branches big, right? Okay. Um, actually, there is a limit to what the, the ones I can, I, I, I'm doing. Uh, one is the upper secondary level. What I'm already teaching is very, very tough. Can you imagine I'm teaching students at uh, Form 3 to do academic writing skills? You know, and I'm laying the foundation at year, uh, at, five, at standard five, 11 years old. So, and to take it all the way there, by the time they're in form five, to be able to do thesis statements and all that, uh, it's actually beyond a lot of people uh, to teach and it takes a long time to train. I got people to follow my classes so that they know how to explain and why, you know, because uh, there the instructions we teachers give sometimes people don't think about the fact that it's con it, it's uh, it that's a um, it's it's opposite it's contradicting one another like say for instance uh, to do a piece of writing at college you're supposed to do research you're supposed to use the information but do not copy what in the world does that even mean right so they're told that by different people at different stages, but it didn't make sense. So I had to make sense for my college students as to what do we mean by copy and how do you write on your own? And sometimes a simple instruction, like write in your own words. Yep. Keep it simple, write in your own words. They don't believe me. You know how hard it is to convince students at that age to write in their own words? Mm -hmm. But I can't write better than this. They keep wanting to write well. I say, no, you do that, you get zero, you write in your own words you get, you score. Literally, things like this, we had to inform. Re-engineer, yeah. Yeah, but you got to share with them what is copying and what isn't, you know. But anyway, so that, that's a whole different ballgame. And I had to, I, I created that in my curriculum. So I knew that there was a limit to, to doing this. But um, now, actually for four years now, I have the solution to it. 
Um, so now my daughter uh, and uh, the friend, uh, the, they're taking on my English classes because I had no time to grow this new thing that I'm doing that's easy to replicate all over. And yet you're using technology, um, you unlock writing, reading, you unlock social intelligence, you unlock all at the same time. It's an English experience. So tell me more about this. Um, yeah, because I am um, partnering up with a, uh, an ex-student of mine uh, who has this program, uh, an online program, uh, which, you know, students can, children can actually interact with it. So we have already started using it in our school called Me Books, and um, we created a curriculum to support it. Yeah, with that, I can, I will not have IP issues and that one, I can license it. So um, we're working on that, but I need a whole team just to take care of this. So it's coming, but not yet. And then at the secondary level, uh, we're also going into a whole different space using social media. You know, that one, um, when I, I have the marketing part of it uh, down pat, then I will speak more about it. But we're going to use social media. Okay. So I guess because of the demand for what you're doing, um, capital is not a requirement because obviously, you know, the nature of education is that fees are paid ahead of or, or on time. La, because, the, you know, obviously the parents want their children to be continuously educated. If they miss the fee payments, then the kids don't need to get educated. So in terms of Maslow's law of hierarchies, that has to be paid. La, huh? Like the housing loan has to be paid. Tuition fees have to be paid. Otherwise, kids don't get educated. So... So obviously you don't you don't need a lot of capital. Oh, we do. But you do. But in terms of funding, there's cash flow, right? Yes, Which comes through correct. the to, through the coffers. Why did you go down the international school route? Because in international school, I think you do IGCSE and as well as KSSM, right? You don't just teach English, or you teach everything else. Why did you decide to go down that path? Oh, hmm. bear in mind this is teachers, huh? I'm, I, and I've got a bunch of teachers who joined me to do this. Uh, I knew that I couldn't do it through the public school route. Yeah? Wait, Be hang on. Why? Yes, um, because there's, there are too many things that I have to do to change. And people don't like to be told that they have to change what they have been doing all these years. This is the, the ideal of getting people to speak better English, right? Or to communicate better. Um, yeah, because I, 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 went, I went to schools to even talk to them about that five-minute thingy. Mm. They didn't believe me because it's just too easy. It doesn't come from any English education space or, you know, uh, if you go into universities, you're not going to learn that. You see, it's just way too easy. Uh, there's, there doesn't even ha there's no name for it even. Mm. Uh, I, I went to one school to talk about this. I went to a nursing school, college to talk about this. And I realized no, no takers because the teachers themselves don't, don't, don't agree with it because they've been trained a different way. So I had a lot of students asking me to go into the schools. But I said, you know, language learning requires a lot of time. Yeah, I can't go in and do a month. I can't go in to do even a year. It's on and on and on and on until you have the, you're in the position to make the decision to make that happen, you, it, it won't work. Yeah, so it's better than not to knock your head against a brick wall, just do it, you, you know, on, on your own self. Yeah. And, and I don't blame you because, you know, the public school system is an edifice which um, is very hard to break down. La. But what baffles me is the education. I mean, in, in our heart of hearts, students and parents are like, we know there's something wrong with the system. We still persevere with it. I, I've sat in on remote classes for BM with my kids because they're both in KSSM, right? And it's the most mundane, the most banal, the most boring environment in the history of civilization and humankind. And yet they still continue to go with it. I don't get it, right? They should re-engineer the whole system. And I, I can't remember the guy who, who was on the TED Talks. I think it's the most famous TED Talk of all time. With Sir Ken Robinson. Sir Ken Robinson, right? Education is industrialized. We sit in the classroom. You know, you have one guy in front delivering the sermon to 30, 40 kids. And it's been like that for years. But uh, when you are in that position to re-engineer that, um, and why do you continue that system? Why don't you just... You know, reconfigure it. I mean, it's the same thing. Why? Yeah. We did. The reason why, why we got to this point was we re-engineered everything. Uh, in fact, I think we're the only school system right now in teacher training in Asia that's certified by Education Alliance Finland. 
Okay, so the Scandinavian model is something to be revered, but yeah. okay, tell me how you re engineered it. Okay, we looked at education because I come from teaching in the college space. The first person I brought back to our country was my sister because she was trained uh, to be an engineer in Singapore, NUS, and she was teaching in a Singapore school because she didn't want to go into the, the, the industry, you know. Um, so I, for 20 over years, and I got her to come back, I said, we need you. So when she came back, I got my whole complete system. And so between the two of us, we looked at both the humanities and the language side and the math and the sciences. We re-engineered it all the way back down to kindergarten. You know, so, but we started at the secondary because that was the space that was much needed. Kids were miserable at school, but they loved coming to our classes. And we did tuition at that time, right? So she came back, gave up everything in Singapore, uh, being the head of her department as well. Um, she gave everything up. Sing Dollars was the one that she gave up. And she came back um, and she was teaching from her home, uh, math and sciences, and I was doing language. Um, so we, we both knew there were so many things wrong. Wait till you hear what is wrong with the math and the sciences, right? She was like baffled because the students were learning at math from her and didn't seem to have the the foundation of it, right? So I'm, I'm going to speak very bluntly here as to what has gone off. Be as blunt as possible. Thank you. All right. So she told me, she said, she didn't believe the students when they said that, no, they've not learned it, right? So she checked back backwards to year, uh, from one, from two, from three books. Sure enough, topics were missing, you know, for them to do at math. It's like you're climbing a um, five-story building, but you climb up to the third story and the fourth uh, the third floor to the fourth floor steps are missing. That is akin to that. And now you got to continue on the fifth floor by yourself, right? So it's no wonder a lot of us all feel like an. We all feel like it. I don't. I don't know. I felt like an idiot doing at math, you know, back in the days. But then now you find out it's really not your fault. It's just something is missing with the system, right? And so you're talking about um, the education system being very siloed, very siloed. That means when you're teaching lower sec you're teaching lower sec, you're trained for lower sec, upper sec is upper sec. But then nobody seems to be aware that there's something missing between that and the ad math. And she discovered that because she said, no, these topics are already done in sec one, sec two in Singapore. Why is it not in there? Wait till you hear some more. We have physics. Physics in form four, there is a topic in there that uh, requires math, but it's only taught in form five math. So you don't have the tools at that level to learn the subject, which is crazy. I hope somebody listens to this and do, does something about it, you know, because we're doing it in our own school, but that's because we have control. We shifted out everything, topics, um, like we don't follow the textbooks the, at the, in the order it's given. If this topic is linked to something in year 11, we do it straight away. You know, if these three, three uh, like physics and uh, uh, chemistry, these two topics are linked. My teachers know how to link it because um, I, this is the other thing we, we, we reverse engineered, who to teach. Uh, we brought in engineers, a lot of engineers are in my school. Uh, we brought in biomedical degree holders and and so on, uh, communications degree, um, etc. cetera, uh, accountants and financial uh, people, including um, even economics degree holders. So we train them how to teach because it's faster that way. But because no teacher training college can train people to become engineers, right? But that's what you need. You need people who know, who, you know, who actually know how the subjects combine and interact with one another, yeah. not siloed. If you, if you find our children coming out siloed, it's because the whole system from kindergarten was completely siloed. Can I just take a little detour here, Anne? Because um, the Singapore education system, you know, uh, uh, on most international rankings, are uh, top 10 and not top 5. Lah, okay? It is the envy of the world. And Malaysian education system is, I, th I think, at best, top 200. Lah, okay? And we are not <laughs> the envy of the world. But then Malaysian graduates, right, and Singapore graduates, when you ask, anecdotally at least, right, um, who are most appealing to hire, okay? And they will typically say, oh, in Singapore, Malaysian graduates are, are sought after because they have an additional dimension. They've got more colour, more personality, more charisma. And the kind of people that Singapore tends to churn out tend to be a bit um, 
for want of a better word, a bit auto auto automaton like, lah, a bit robotic, right? Very processed, very clear, very black and white. But then don't ask them to divert off the path because they cannot, they cannot process that, right? Um, why, why is that the case? Okay. Why are Malaysians, despite, despite all these things wrong with the system, you know, come out quite appealing? Lah. Okay. Now, um, we, we realize, yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to go backwards a little bit before I get there, right? So that it gives people an idea why that happens because there is an explanation to it. Okay. Uh, when I started doing English, I was doing a, I was, a lot of things I was doing was very human based. Right, so when I started the English the, the the school, I had to sit down with my sister and say, "How do we want to do it? Do you want to do we want to create a different system?" Or she said, "No, I want what you have created." And we realized over the years was that everything that we do, whether it's econs, um, accounting, math, at math, or physics or whatever, we have actually wrapped the human component around the entire system. So imagine doing at math where you have to um, you, you oh, math and you debate in maths. Right? Uh, what about you know going to the water theme park and doing at math experiments? People are like what? Uh, singing songs in physics and you know doing tai chi moves, you know for for biology that sort of thing. I got tons, but those are some of the things. So we we actually added in the human component. What's the human component? We are random. We love fun. We want to play and we want to enjoy ourselves. Right? And the other thing is we want to talk to one another not sit still and keep quiet and not move. And we're doing that to children six to seven hours every day for 11 years and we expect them to be excitable and passionate about what they learn. It's worse than prison. I'm putting it out there that it's worse than prisons. Please stop doing that to children. Okay? So that's the first thing that we realized that we did. We wrapped the human component around it. But what we, we didn't know until our students started going out to work was that it was the human skills that allowed them to do really well. So when you hear people saying, you know, the A students, at the end of the day, you know, the C students are doing well. Okay. Now, A students with human skills will do exceptionally well too. In fact, they will soar. But if you are B, C, D, E, F, G students, or you can't even go to, to, to school or college, but if you have the human skills, you will do extremely well. Okay, so Malaysians versus Singaporean graduates. Yes. So coming back to that, um, yes, you, you have to see do well in what, right? Um, if you look at top five in the countries for the ratings, uh, the, the education ratings, it's all Asian countries, right? The, the, the Western countries start to show up at number six, number seven, number eight. I can name you who they are. And one of them have actually been number one, number two. But Asians, they cannot. We must be number one, number two. So they drove the kids further academically to, to top. So now Asian countries are top five. But it's one dimensional. Now I, I figured ways to explain to parents. It's very one dimensional. If, because everybody has got education. So uh, if you have education, then your value is 1x. So you want to double up your child's value, you got to wrap it with the human component. It doubles up. It's not even like a 20% on top of it. It doubles up. You want to triple it? Entrepreneur skills and business skills. And that's why we, we started the first entrepreneur school in the country. Yeah. I'd, I'd venture to say that entrepreneurialism cannot be taught. It's, it's um, you know, it, it's like um, entrepreneurialism is basically someone like you spotting a gap in the market and then filling it, right? Um, if you teach that, then you've missed the point. It's like when someone puts up their hand in, in an entrepreneur conference and says, uh, hey, Tansri, you know, what business should I start now? Then you've missed the point already because you don't see the gaps, right? You've got to be told the gaps. So I just wanted to go back to the Malaysian graduates, right? My, my working thesis for Malaysian graduates being more employable is the diversity in the country. From a very early age, they've got to somehow find a way to communicate with other children of different cultures, different languages um, in a, in a multi-racial society. In Singapore, which is slightly more, more homogenous, shall we say, lah, huh? more Chinese than anything else, right? They don't have that, um, you know, that that life challenge in front of them. And in Malaysia, you've got the additional elements of, you know, things are not as great as as in a first world country. You've got to somehow deal with it, and those challenges maketh the man. Do you know what I mean, right? So, so those things, 
additional on top of the basic education, and that's at best basic lah, huh? then they come up with three dimensions or four dimensions of ability, which then make them more palatable in the workspace because they're more teamwork driven, they're more um, able to deal with challenges and the problem solve. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Yeah, a lot of it you're saying is correct, actually, because of that. Um, we struggle more because, um, you know, because Malaysian is really not known for education and parents who can pay are opting out from a free education, right? So you're absolutely right there. And the fact is that we, we mix more with each other. I'm not talking about just races, right? I'm also talking about A, B, C, D students work together. Uh, we are more in, uh, interactive that way because... Um, Singapore, I know they tend to um, isolate their strong students. Yeah, they really, screen, really... Lah, right? The top kids go here, the average kids go there, and then the basket cases go there. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. So I, this came from Singaporeans yeah, themselves who told me that um, the, 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 the students are really, really strong in Singapore. They have a tougher time handling uh, people across the board. They, it's harder for them to communicate with, say, a cleaner or a a security guard, but when you're at the top of your game, you're supposed to handle a whole company, right? Uh, that was what I was told. Um, and uh, yes, you're absolutely right because... I mean, we know yeah. streaming exists, right? Yes. And uh, I guess that's part of the reason why we extrapolate that over 50 years. You've got, you know, uh, Fortune 500 companies where the salary of, a CEO, salary of a CEO is 55 or 60 times that of the lowest employee. And that top guy cannot talk to that guy because he has no, or he or she has no idea how to communicate with this person, then that's a real problem. Yeah. Then you've got unions and strikes and what have you. And the other thing is because as a, as a country, we, our social economic status is actually quite diverse. So we work very closely with everybody, including our, our children, you know. They go down, there's, a, you know, there's the, the, the machi, you know, selling nasi lemak to, you know. Literally, we have a lot of, and you know, the burger, Ramli burger store. Right, so this is all part and parcel of our community, whether we live in very affluent residential areas or not. So that in itself has got allows us more um, access, and um, you know, this, it, it's it's a given. You have to interact, right? And when they go out uh, to Singapore, it allows that better. Yeah. yeah so I. I talked a lot to my friends, you know, after having come to the fifth decade of your life, you see and, you know, understand certain things and that's, I guess that's what age gives you, right? Perspective, right? And one comes to realize that the technical skills one learns in university and school does not, is not a strong predictor of success in life. Life success factors um, depend not just on your technical skills, but beyond that, the ability to communicate with people, social and interpersonal skills, your financial literacy, your ability to deal with challenges and resilience and adversity and being able to come back from, you know, having been pushed down and fallen on your face in the past. A lot of people can't do that, right? And increasingly so. So um, I want to take the, the dis discussion a little bit further and ask you um, how you're dealing with this whole idea of technology, you know, potentially displacing the whole idea of education. Because now if your kid can't write, lah, huh? He just types in a few keywords into ChatGPT or Sydney or Bing or whatever it is. And then, push, the prose comes out. And I've got to say, it's pretty bloody good. You know, it can write really, really well. It may not be factually correct, but it, it's really good. Okay, So, like my son, I gave him an essay to write the other day, 300 words, right? I said, keep it short, 300 words, fine. What he delivered to me was pretty bloody good, right? And I know some of the th stuff that is inside there. He doesn't have the ability. Lah. So I know he's used technology. So as a parent, I know that technology is here to stay. They've got to somehow integrate into their lives. Do I say, don't use ChatGPT? Or do you say, let him, let it pass? He's got to use it somehow, but at least customize it to your own. So as an educator and as an entrepreneur, right? Okay. How do you write? Should you still teach writing? Technology is here to stay. And ChatGPT uh, is level one, you know. In 10 years' time, it could, be, it could be level 25. That's the speed of innovation now. Yeah. Teach them to write anyway, but they can learn how to use the chat GPT. Okay, because um, for us, uh, in, in when, what we are doing in the school is we don't stop our students from bringing their devices to school because they're using it. They're taking notes in it, right? Uh, and they are even doing research on it. The work that they do with their friends, they're communicating a lot on it. So at secondary level, we don't hold back on allowing them to bring 
their devices. Uh, phone, handphones, not a problem. Uh, so we teach them the protocol of how to handle it. Now, then uh, the primary kids, we control it a bit more, more because of what they download. So we provide, uh, you know, the iPads from the school in class, but they can bring the phones, but they put in their lockers. If the teachers need them to use it, they bring it out. So our, our relationship with technology can be quite different from many schools. Now, the next thing is that make use of technology, but don't let it control you. So the only way to do that is you have to build the human skills. That is what we've spent our entire lifetime working with the children on their creative skills, on, you know, to be very creative, to know how to pivot, to know how to, um, you know, you, you, we, we explore emotions. We encourage them to feel. So whatever we do in the classroom, you want the kids to feel excited about something, whether it's horrific or not, you have to make them feel. And emotions must be engaged. If whatever you're doing, it's only boredom, forget it. So the mandate in what we do in the school is that all teachers have to build rapport with the kids. So it's a human component front and center. Then whatever you do with technology, it will be human led and not technology led. But it'll come a point where I'm already prepared for the day education, all the learning you find online will be better than even teachers, right? So when that happens, we already have an education system to replace it you know, which is how to use whatever you know. Yeah, so we've got it all down already. Right now, we're doing about 10 hours a week of that. I can literally turn it 40 hours a week using that system alone. Uh, we can replace uh, education. Okay, so here's the thing, Anne. All of what you said makes complete sense to me. My only issue is that um, why must education in this form and, and nature um, be exclusionary in nature? Which means to say, only people who can pay school fees to the extent that private school and, and international school fees can pay. Now, this is exclusionary and to me, as kind of like a semi-socialist, okay. <laughs> semi-socialist capitalist, right? The Scandinavian model, right? Mm. Um, should not be the way. La. It should be delivered to everybody. Okay. And the kids who need it the most cannot afford it. Correct. Absolutely. I get asked this all the time. Um, I will come from this space, not exclusivity, choice choice. If you give this to the regular parents, they're not going to choose what we're doing. I, I've tried. You know, I've gone out there to talk to people. They say, don't, uh, this is going to distract my kids. Can you just focus? No, I but need them going to get through. KSSM and IGCSE, right? Uh, no, no, no. My school is all IGCSE. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so for them to forsake KSSM and go to the, in a way, higher level IGCSE, why not? Number one, the parents, number one, the parents want the kids to be happy in school, okay? I have a problem in my school which is very different. My kids don't want holidays and we make it that way. So to do, to get down to the ground, you need the might of the government. That's how Finland does it. It was across the country, the might of the government. The, the reason why we're doing it out of the whole system is because we knew we had to prove it. Because otherwise, and you'll be very happy to know that there's a government in our neighboring country, they're going to be certifying our teacher training for early childhood. Wait, so no, just from the perspective of the parents, right? Um, I want to understand. So if I'm a, you know, um, poor parent, lah, you know, mm. um, and I want my kid to have the best education, right? My only choice is a state school. I, if I want to send him or her to your school, I've got to pay IGCSE fees, and as I understand it, IGCSE is at least twenty-five to thirty thousand a year, yes. something like that, right? At least the cheapest of the cheapest are about twenty twenty-five thousand a year. Okay, let me share this with you. Do you know I have a whole my whole um, uh, teaching, um, you know, in all my schools in the group, we we take care of all the demographics, literally. My English classes, will you, they can acquire these skills. It's akin to taking a public transport, the pricing of it. You can choose to go down to KL and take whichever type of transport you want, right? My Dwee Amas is, of course, at the top end because it's, a, it's an entrepreneur school and mostly I have entrepreneurs in there or business owners in there. They send the kids there. Generally, others may not want to. 
Then, uh, so that is like a Mercedes. And then you have the Mazda and you have the Proton, which I have in Kota Kamuning. You know, so we, we decided... So the Kota Kamuning, how much are the fees? Uh, less than 20,000. It's still yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. So my English classes, you acquire the same skills, but for about a thousand ringgit a year, right? But the next step we're going into is actually working with the with um, uh, ministry. So we're in talks with one particular ministry so that we don't go with through the uh, MOE system. Then it's not threatening. We are going from the other route where we are going to be working with children, but we are bringing entrepreneurs there, but funded by, we are working, we, we are looking for foundations to work with so that we can take this in. Um, the one, okay, uh, I don't know if this is the place to talk about it at the moment, but uh, one of the groups of people that we are working with, we are already in talks and agreement is there now, I need funding. We are working with the, um, you know, with our athletes in our country, right? The other one I want to do is actually with uh, those who are being, who are training in the in the school of sports, right? So we want to help them have the tools so that when they come out, they have more than education and the sports skills that they can opt to become their own, you know, business owners. Um, so that's that's one thing that we are working towards. But we do we had to succeed in it before. Uh, people would listen. Yeah, so I, I think we've taken a bit of a detour because I, I think at the core of it all, um, you know, and the, the sense is that either you're an educator and then you want to educate everybody uh, as much as possible to, so that they can have these life skills, or, and this can be, you know, mutually ex exclusive, you are an entrepreneur and of course there's a commercial element to what you do. Oftentimes these two elements don't overlap so well because if you want to train everybody, and educate them and give it away for free, then the commercial element is kind of like thwarted, right? Yeah. So that's that's what I mean. So if 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 what you can if what you are if what you do can be delivered to every Malaysian child, respect even respective of whether their parents can afford the school fees or not, then that's the holy grail. But even at twenty thousand a year, not many parents can afford that. We we know that. But that's that's you see that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to get to the rest. But you can't go down that route and go straight away. What about individual learning centers where, you know, like there's one time I, I, I interviewed an, an Indian eye, eye, eye hospital, right? And in this Indian eye hospital, the founder told me, in India, eye problems are very common, okay? And everybody cannot afford eye treatment. So what they did is they started this, this hospital where the one paying patient who went in for expensive operations are like aesthetic surgery and you know double eyelids and whatever or maybe triple eyelid I can't remember what right would then pay the fees he the fees he paid would pay for the nine other kids who couldn't afford it right mm -hmm. and I don't see why we can't do that in Malaysia well somebody still has to pay right so that's why we are going down the route with somebody helping pay for these kids and there are many many organizations out there including companies who would want to get this down to the students so we are working towards that uh, but I really, if, if government, our own government want us to do this, I'm very happy to do it. So that's why for us, we have to prove it. And we have. And in fact, this year, when everything opened up again last year, we of course had to take care of our own, uh, to make sure that we can survive through uh, the aftermath of uh, COVID, right? But uh, even uh, last year itself, we started talking more to our government in order to see how to get this down. And you are right in that. Um, uh, okay, let me let me put it this way. Um, a lot of people seem to see education and entrepreneurship as two separate things, and one being more social and the other being very very commercial, right? I don't. I see them together because right now we are trying to convince people that um, you have okay especially if we want to train people to become leaders right you have the leadership skills but then when you do entrepreneurship you bring in a very separate set of leadership skills you know this is leading organizations right and it doesn't mean that you have to run your own business but but you know what why are we doing education for is to get the kids to be able to work and be productive in whichever organization they are in. Now, if they have entrepreneurship skills, I can tell you their worth in their organization is way higher because they, the thinking process and the skills that they have 
to lead the organization is ad additional to the leadership skills. So this is how I see these two. They go hand in hand. And it's like you bring that each, all this together, it's 360 degrees leadership and not one or the other. So the weight and the might of the government is the only force that can deliver this to every Malaysian kid, let alone every kid in every country in the world, okay? Now, when you study the annual budget of Malaysia, right, the last budget announced last year was the highest it's ever been, something like 330 billion ringgit or something, right, on the OPEC side, not on the DEVEC side, OPEX, okay? So then the allocation to the education ministry, I think typically it's top three or top four. Lah. I think the PMO is something, defense is something, education, right? Education gets about at least I don't know, 50 billion or 40, 54, billion. 54 billion, right? We've got two ministries, mm. higher education and lower education. And I, I think the number of people employed in there is off the scale. Why can't they deliver something which is of value to the system? It has taken them so long. What is the impediment there? Um, do you want, I, I, I did this. Unvarnished truth, please. Okay, right, yeah. So I'm going to give you in numbers, yeah. You'll be horrified by the numbers. Um, because I, I was speaking at the Women's Economic Forum that was held recently in Malaysia, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, how, how do I talk about e the economic part of education? So I got my people to help me do a bit of research, you know, as to how much we spend getting ourselves educated as parents. Now, we found this in the New Straits Times and um, the number across the board average is 25,000 US dollars per child that a parent spends. Now, so that is, um, you know, inclusive of those who don't spend and those who spend a heck of a lot, right? So I started looking at that and thinking backwards to my time, yeah, uh, which was in the seventh, uh, late 60s and, and 70s. That was during the time when I was educated. Uh, we don't really go for tuition because we don't have the funds. Um, but I did go for some from four, from five level, and we were paying like maybe 10, 15 ringgit a month for BM tuition or an ad math. Dying, dying in ad math, right? So, <laughs> but gave it up in six months. So my parents saved some money there. Then I went through public university, which was a few hundred a semester, right? So back then I was like thinking, we spent very little, but at the end of the day, the outcome of the education is that I got my job. Then I realized today, the tertiary system and all but students, doesn't matter where they go, but what skills they have is still very limited to getting the first job. But we are spending a heck of a lot more, you know? So, okay, $25,000 per parent. This is dollars or ringgit? Dollars. Okay. okay, US dollars. And what I did was I calculated it across, uh, this across the whole education lifespan, right? Then I calculated against um, the um, uh, 450,000 students in year one right now. Nationwide? Uh? Nationwide. Okay, yeah. You m multiply that, it's, it's crazy 49.5 billion ringgit. And I'm not counting from standard one to 11, you know. You're talking about half a trillion. And for what purpose? It's still to get the first job. Because I, I sat down to look into the skill set because, you know, as business owners, we are struggling with promoting people. We're struggling with hiring managers, uh, group level people. No quality. Not enough quality. Not enough. And I realized the foundation that they, I, I did a bit of research because I looked at the skills the kids come up with. And what are we complaining about in terms of uh, the kids graduating, right? The, the young people graduating. Uh, what, in the, what, what sort of skills do they have? I listed them all down and then I started looking at headhunters. I went online to research what exactly, what skills they're looking for to be the CEO of companies, to be um, maybe international group level you know, managers and so on, directors. And I started to realize that there's a whole lot of skills that they need to have and foundation of it is in school, given a one, vision and passion. Passion is actually energy. But in school, you cannot move. You have to sit still. The energy gets completely suppressed out of you. You're supposed to have finely tuned intuition. You're not allowed to guess in school. You have to know the answers. You know, so how do you finally tune the intuition when the intuition is not even allowed in the first place? You see, so I started looking and then I started looking at the, the attributes of entrepreneurs. 
and the list, the wretch that showed up, I was like, wait a minute, there's something seriously wrong here, you know. And then, um, then we realized that the foundation you lay has to allow the children to become more, to master the skills when they come out after high school, right? But if they don't have it in the first place, they come out from high school and now they have to start acquiring it. It's late. Some will not even acquire it because it's already set. Yeah. So this is where we find ourselves in now, okay? As parents of children now who have to deal with a very uncertain future and huge volatility, I'm not sure whether we are equipping our kids with the tools and the skills to deal with this, this kind of future, right? We can only hope we as parents can unilaterally do as much as we can, and some of it is left to the school, okay? Now here's the thing. So as you say, the Malaysian government spends 54 billion ringgit, right? Uh, in the public school system, don't even talk about international schools and private schools. The common wisdom among parents is that your kid, if you go through private all the way to university, is about 1 million ringgit. 1 million ringgit per kid, okay? Then the kid comes out, okay, la, just say the father doesn't own his own company, la, comes out, gets a job outside. Starting salary, 3,000 ringgit if you're lucky. I mean, what the hell, man, right? How long is it going to take for you to recoup that investment? It's a cost. It's not an investment. It's a cost. Thirty-six thousand in year one, three hundred sixty thousand in, in ten years. It's going to take you over twenty years to re- recover that. Doesn't make sense, right? So to me, education once it's being privatized and commercialized, it becomes an industry. And once it becomes an industry, the results don't really matter, but the PNL matters. So I'm not going to against someone like you because I think your heart is in the right place, and. But something's got to be done. I don't know. I don't know how it's going to be done. But something's got to be done. But you're right. This is exactly the space we are coming from. You know, to give value to the children. You're absolutely right. They have to be able to command a lot more to make sense of the amount that we're spending, and because we keep thinking of education for free, right? But the cost to it is really tremendous to the country. And the amount parents spend on tuition alone is ridiculous. One of my students told me he was in public school. He said my mom said that I cost her a Mercedes and there were five of them. Each kid, each child cost the parents a Mercedes. And the parents were spending about anything between 500 ringgit to 1,000 ringgit a month on tuition alone. So the cost of it is tremendous. So you're talking about free education. It is not free. It's not free. It's it not is free. not free. Do you do tertiary? What's your view on university? Okay, you know what you're saying is what a lot of young parents today are realizing. And so they're looking for a different route, you know. Um, what does that route look like? Okay. Um, okay, let's just blunt. say you're starting today. La. You don't have three schools. You don't have 2,000 students. You don't have hundreds of teachers, right? Your anthem, tuition teacher, starting out, looking at the landscape and thinking, holy shit, this place is a mess. And you're going to have a blank piece of paper and they're going to draw your your map. What does that map look like? Um, it's going to have to be completely practical. Right now, it's a 80%. Um, okay, some schools or universities focus on the more TVET area. Um, in fact, you need that. So you're looking at primary, secondary or tertiary? Uh, tertiary requires to change that and and. Primary and secondary, you got to bring those down to the ground to make sense of the kids. That's why I brought entrepreneurship in. And uh, in just when COVID hit, we, we set up our uh, biosphere school where we converged environment, entrepreneurship and education. And I found that actually makes the most sense for the children. Okay, so um, you got to bring these things and bring it into the classroom for the kids. And it cannot be a by the side kind of thing. It literally has to be integrated into your whole entire education system. Whether you do math or physics or chemistry or econs, this thing must must drive it. You see? So right now, even if people bring it in, whether it's environment, it's separate, you you do it as a COCO, COCO curricular activity, or uh, you join it as a club, which is a club, or um, the, the, the school might run campaigns and they might do projects. But beyond that, it's not integrated. It's got to be integrated. Um, so that's what we've been working on to bring it down all the way to the ground with uh, primary, secondary. Our entrepreneurship is integrated. So the education system is front and center. And you'll be surprised when I told parents this, uh, the kids are acquiring um, the, the uh, multiple skills and therefore they have multiple access, multipliers, right? And people are wondering, but then won't that 
take more time. They're already spending 12 hours a day studying. You'll be surprised. When you put this in, you take 60% of time it takes to just acquire academic skills. The reason why it takes so long is you've got to force it. Forcing takes a lot of energy, time, resources, and money. When you embed all these things in, it makes sense to the kids. They sit, the kids are like, oh, I have to do presentation. Oh, now I know that because I have to convince people with what I do. And they do it at primary level. It makes sense. Why wait? You see? So, but we make it more fun. You don't bring it down and examine them for heaven's sakes. Right? Yeah. You make it lifestyle. So another detour, uh, and you, you, you know, obviously it, this is something which has taken, you know, the intuity or at least most of the intuity of your of your mind and consciousness the last, I don't know, thirty years or whatever, right? How then did you juggle life as an individual, as as a parent, as a as as a spouse, you know? Um, you've got to sacrifice, right? So the typical, you know, a lot of the, the refrains that entrepreneurs say is, uh, this, this baby takes all my time, I've got no time for anything else, right? But you're a parent as well. Yeah. You're also a spouse as well, right? How do you deal with all that? Um, okay, because a lot of people think that you have to separate yourselves. I, do, I didn't. I, so your kids, your daughters went into school. Yes. Yeah, and so um, you saw them. My, my children are already working. In fact, I had to wait until they finish, uh, they finish. They had to finish from five before I could start my school. Right? But I did my English curriculum for them. So from very the get-go, they see me as mother and teacher. You know, uh, And because as mothers, we teach our kids. So, um, but that shift, I also had to adjust it for them as well. Um, and then um, my, pet, my, my husband came in to join me, right? So, okay, maybe let me put it this way. A lot of people see it that you have to sacrifice. I didn't want that. I figured, uh, I said, look, you know, we have to, to be able to have everything. You know, if we do it right, let's, let's see if we can work it so we can, can do it right. Um, so I immediately started working with friends. So now I've got my friends. And then um, I brought their families in. So now I've got more friends. Then the next step was um, we brought, it grew to a point where family and friends not enough yet to bring people in from outside. And they stayed with us because uh, the, f the whole environment was more friendly and it was more f like family. Um, and that family means we are also very blunt with each other, right? So they came in and I don't know how to work it that you work with people for five years and not be friends. So from the get-go, um, ever since I, I was working, before I went into teaching, right, I was working in the corporate world, I was like, you know, there has to be a better way of doing this. Um, I want to work with people I like, you know. And then I also wanted to be, I wanted the place to be one where I want to come to work every day and be with people I want to be with. So I said, I'm sure we can, uh, you know, do something like that. That's why I did my own thing. And we, we went for that. And today, that's what we have. I have friends at work. I don't have, like, staff. So whenever I have to use the word staff, I'm uncomfortable because they're friends. Because I've known them for too long. I know their kids, you know, um, and I know their parents. I know where they live. They know where I live. I go home. I don't know who's going to be at my house because they're also friends with my children. You know, so I, I don't know how we are, we are working on growing this, this culture of, of work, you know, um, because uh, we have opened three schools with exactly the same culture. We're opening two more with exactly the same culture. We know we can do this. Uh, we're opening ki kindergartens with this culture. We're going to do a university with this culture because um, we're going to collab be collaborating with one. And I know that the What kind of courses would you teach? Um... Can, I'll work on that first and maybe that's another story another day because um, I, I need to make sure everything is in place before I talk about it, yeah? Uh, the very things that need to change in education, I want to have the access to change it. Um, and there are two parties out there I know who will, who will be happy to change it with me. Yeah. Um, what, are the schools you're, what are the two schools you're starting is in Penang? One is in Penang. Which is your alma mater. Yes. Yeah. Convent Light Street. Uh, yes. What's going to happen there? Um, okay. Uh, for that, we are with bringing our system there. Uh, we're probably bringing entrepreneurship there as well. Um, we got we we have a very very cool collaboration with the sisters, because uh, the ethos of the sister 
is the sisters, is to actually make this available to as many young people as possible. Um, and uh, with the way we have um, done the, the collaboration with them, uh, we will be able to do it. Yeah, to keep it really, really, um, you know, how much the parents are spending for tuition instead of doing that, just you can have a whole school system. That was, uh, that was what we, we um, you know, from day one when we discussed with the sisters uh, was for that to happen. Yeah, so they don't spend more money. Yeah, but they're going to spend money anyway, even with a free, uh, free system. Uh, that's one. Then um, I've got Melinda is going up there to anchor the place, my sister. Yeah. So right now we are going up there. Uh, we're working to get people to get to know us better, you know. Okay. That's all I can say at the moment. Okay, so it's a, <laughs> it's a chapter which has yet to be written, but I'm sure which will be quite entertaining. Um, let's, let's close with some principles from you, Anne. Um, what, what attributes does the 22-year-old um, graduate need to have to deal with and to navigate successfully the modern world? Oh, right. They have to have skills more than education, the degree that they have. They have to have more skills than that. So whatever opportunities they can get to, to work with people, to collaborate. Um, and, and the one thing that I want to discourage uh, young people from doing is from wanting to only work with people as good as you or better than you. Because I come across quite a few who only want to do that. Um, they give respect to those who, who, who are better. Um, but if you are not as good or, you know, uh, not better than them, they may not necessarily want to work with you because you're in group work, you have to carry them, right? Um, avoid doing that, I would say. Okay, because, work with all levels of society. Yes. Okay. Because the question is, if you're doing that, would you like someone who's better than you to do the same thing? Not wanting to work at you. How how much how much of a guarantee can you give me that someone better than you would want to work with you? If this is how we navigate the world, so don't do that. And uh, when you work with people around you who are not as strong as you are, it's an excellent opportunity for you to grow your leadership skills, because the mandate of a leader is to grow leaders. What you want is someone working with you at the end of the time they work with you, that they become way better than they ever were before they joined you or when they joined you. Okay, When you work with people who are not as strong as you, you will have the opportunity to do that. That would be my biggest advice I would give to young people anywhere. Okay, okay. and as someone who has come from, I can glean three different careers. You said you were in the corporate world before you became a teacher. Then you became a teacher, and now you're a business owner, right? So you've, you've dealt with three different, well, sea changes in your life, right? How would you advise people who are looking for sea changes in their life as well? You know, radical changes, changes in career, changes in direction. How would you advise people to do that? Um, okay. Uh, this is actually from some of my business mentors. Uh, because when I did it... Uh, from nothing, right? You want to be able to do it from nothing because most of us do not have the kind of resources to do big things. Um, and uh, with nothing, you can start small. And that's why entrepreneurship is so key because it is about doing very li uh, doing a lot with very little. And uh, it nobody says you cannot. That's the point. Nobody says you cannot, right? So I, I started with that and uh, it was about impacting people around you first, those who want. I, I focus purely on people who want that difference, people who believe in the fact that education has to be different. Um, I want my child to be happy in school. I cannot see, I cannot stand to see them really miserable. So those are the parents that we work with. And the more we can get to parents like that, the more we can grow. So I would say that, th that you can do the same thing. If you want to make that change, look for people who want the same change and you work with them. But don't throw out your job because uh, if you uh, don't have your baseline and you try to go in on your own, uh, with the minute your money runs out, your business stops. Mm. Or whatever you choose to do, it stops. What have you learned from life and business? Um, okay, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's so much fun. Uh, working with people that uh, can get along with you. I mean, it doesn't mean we don't argue, but you want to bring in people whom you can argue and move forward with. Right, that's very, very critical. So, um, and very real with one another. Uh, that's what I got. 
you know, uh, being an entrepreneur. I could curate. I could um, do where my heart wants me to go. And uh, at the same time, I can provide for my family. Yeah. So right now, my children, I gave them a choice whether to work with me or not. They chose to work with me. But uh, since they were young, they were my child labor, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they were answering phone calls at seven years old, uh, handling like wrapping books with me and I, I didn't pay them because that's training, right? Because <laughs> I mean, there's no free lunch at home, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So instead of doing chores, they helped me with all these things. And uh, because you want them to know how to work hard. Yeah. Today, they're still working very hard. But uh, from the get-go, sleepless nights we've had, doing what we're doing and we are still at it. But we are a bigger group trying to make that difference um, and that's where we're going. That's fantastic Anne. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for your time. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.